Hey guys, hope you're well. My name is Rob. Welcome to Kinetic Rugby League. In this video, I'll be giving you my International Rugby League review. So I'm going to be going through my power rankings of the eight nations that played, at least in the men's category anyway. So the six from the Pacific Championships plus England and Samoa. I'll be going through my top three players in each position. That'll give us a team of the season as well, in my opinion. And then I'll be going through the top five tries of the season as well, again, in my opinion. So let's get started with the power rankings on the international stage. Starting with eighth place, it's going to be the Cook Islands. Unfortunately, they just don't have the firepower throughout their squad to compete with the likes of Fiji and Papua New Guinea. I think in the second game, first half against PNG, they actually did a really good job through the middle. A lot of really great meters helped them tremendously with the field position battle. I think players like Ingatakara at number nine did a great job in that position, came up with a try, maybe two during the campaign, can't quite remember, at least one. But I think they did a really good job defensively and with the ball through the middle against PNG in the second game. There's a lot of hard work they had to get through against Fiji. It was a rough game. I think it was 56-6 in the end. Very rough one. Brad Sakurangi took on a lot of the kicking game at number six. Eastern Masters isn't really a number seven, but he played there and at fullback as well. You know, had a, an okay looking run, run game at times. Eastern Mayoka, relatively young and inexperienced put under a lot of pressure as well at fullback. So they just don't have the firepower to compete at the moment, but there's definitely some good things that they did especially the carries through the middle. They look pretty strong, pretty effective. There's room to grow, and that's at least a positive. Moving on to seventh place, I've got Fiji. They certainly had some good moments. Great scoreline against the Cook Islands, but I think there was too many moments, especially against Papua New Guinea. They looked very uncomfortable. They were quite easily put under pressure, especially Viliami kick out. I think in terms of organization and execution, the intent was incredible. The speed that they played with was fantastic, but execution just wasn't there. I thought their carries through the middle were brilliant. Their carries through the middle were absolutely brilliant, especially from Tui Kamikamitha. I thought he was, I thought he was brilliant. Didn't play many minutes in the second game, but the first game especially was massive for them. Three players that spring to mind for me for Fiji that would help them in the future. Obviously, Brandon Wakem was their number seven during the Rugby League World Cup. He has a lot more experience and probably would have been a little bit more helpful in the seven role with Donahue at six, who can certainly improve and I think did actually do a decent job in both games at times. Then you've got Api Karasau, who could have been their number nine. I don't know why he wasn't picked, maybe an injury. They could at least do with him in the future, hopefully. And then Jareen Bula as the number one, so you can allow Sunia Taruva to take up a different position, either at centre or most likely on the wing. But they've still got Sivo and Valame, who did a pretty good job uh, during this campaign. So Fiji, definitely some good stuff, but a lot to improve on. Still missing key names. Overall was fine, but definitely not competing near the very top. So Fiji in seventh. Moving on to sixth place, I'm going to go with Papua New Guinea. They did some really good stuff in this campaign, some really, really good stuff. I think the most important thing from them was the individuals elevating them slightly. So as a unit, I don't think they were always particularly clean. When they'd spread the ball, it was good at times, but I think a lot of individuals had great sparks here and there, like Nenny McDonald. I didn't know how it was going to go for him at number one, but he looked great. Lamb and Labert commanded their sides, respectively, and Nenny McDonald would pop up where needed. I think the backs did a hell of a lot of work giving relief for the forwards, so that's praise to Robert Darby, Roderick Ty, Elijah Altinga, and uh, Robert Matthias. So they get a lot of praise for the work that they did. Judah Rimbu, Liam Horn as like the switch in nines, even... Horn and DeBellin as the switching 13s at times, did a hell of a lot of work through the middle, like a lot of real solid work. And then you've got the forwards in, Jacob Alec Weinke, Bandy, Alu, Richard, Sylvester Narmo, of course, doing a hell of a lot of work, being really, really resilient. So individually, I think that really elevated them. The only thing now is I think if we get to see more Super League regulars from PNG, and once PNG actually get a team in the National Rugby League, that could really start to elevate their national team. Once we get some regulars that play in the NRL, that's going to take them to a whole nother level. So PNG, definitely some good signs, a lot of quality players across the board, but there's just little things here and there, I think across the, across the board as well, they just need to get better at. But PNG in sixth. Moving on to fifth place, I'm going to have Samoa. It was a little bit disappointing, the kind of lack of control that they had against England, but I think they put in a lot of work through the middle. I think the off-the-cuff moments, especially from Jerome Luai, were really, really good. The kicks into the corners and the kick pressure was really nicely done. Unfortunately, I think they still allowed too many metres through the middle, even when they did try and pin England back. I think... The only thing that still gives them that gap between Papua New Guinea is the fact that when they did shift the ball, they went down the short sides, especially short side left with Jerome Luai. They chucked the ball around. They just worked off the back of each other and came up with some really, really solid tries. So it didn't look that much better than PNG in my opinion. And of course, 
the difference in opponents that needs to be acknowledged. Samoa's taking on England twice, and then PNG are taking on Cook Islands and Fiji. But then there's that performance against New Zealand as well. So Samoa, it was really disappointing. The lack of control, but I think just in most areas, looked a little bit more sure. The way that they'd spread the ball looked a lot cleaner. Defensively, I think was still better in a lot of occasions than PNG. Definitely weren't as open. The most open they looked was when they went a man down, which is, is understandable. But yeah, it's... Just based on context, of course Samoa would be above Papua New Guinea in these power rankings, but it's still pretty disappointing with what Samoa was able to produce. And I do hope that for the Pacific Championships next year, when they'll take Australia's spot, I hope that they have a full team available just of absolute stacked stars and they can look like the Samoa that we kind of hoped that they'd bring to England. But yeah, in fifth place it's going to be Samoa. On to fourth place, I have New Zealand. They definitely did some good stuff, but I was a little bit disappointed, especially with how one-dimensional they were. A lot of it was just down the right side with Johnson, Papali'i, Hiku, and Isako. It wasn't until mostly against Papua New Guinea in that third game that they actually had some opportunities down the left-hand side because defensively, PNG are not going to be able to compete at the same level as Tonga and Australia. So that's understandable. A lot of great individual performances from Johnson, Papali, Ihiku, and Asako. Through the middle, their forwards were brilliant. In the first game for them against Australia, Neem especially was brilliant. Tarpany got through a lot of work and so did Fisher Harris. Crosland played a lot of minutes, had some unfortunate missed tackles that at least one that helped Lindsay Collins get his uh, his opening try against the Kiwis. But he got through a lot of work, 70 minutes in that first game before Cody Nikarima came on. But in terms of the kicking game, it was very basic. The run game, it took a little bit, a little bit too long for me to kind of get them into it. Uh, it wasn't until the second half against Tonga they actually looked like they knew what they wanted to do. They kind of grew into it as they went on, but it was just a little bit too late for them. But yeah, certainly good moments. Defense was a little bit 50-50, kind of half by half in each game. Um, but I think by the end of it, we're just clearly, clearly much stronger. Definitely stronger than PNG, obviously, and definitely look more like they had a clue compared to Samoa, but I can't put them any higher than fourth, really. So yeah, fourth place is New Zealand. Moving on to third place, I have Tonga. Their first game against Australia obviously was disappointing. I think they were the only team throughout all these eight to put up zero points in a game. So that's obviously not something that you want. But in terms of the improvement to the next week, Isaiah Katoa I thought was great. Lola Hea was very underrated. The forwards were exceptional. I think the way that they spread the ball, especially in the second game against New Zealand, really nicely executed on a lot of occasions. I think their goal line defense was pretty solid as well. It just felt like they were more sure of themselves. Against England last year, it was very disappointing the lack of control. It felt like they had control in these games this year with Isaiah Katoa and Tui Lolohea. The forwards were exceptionally powerful, which was great to see. And the way that they spread the ball as well was nice. So certainly improvements. It wasn't just like a three dead performances like it was last season against England. There were some good moments, of course, but they just looked like a proper team in all departments on a more consistent basis this year round. Beating New Zealand was massive. That drop goal from Isaiah Katoa was huge. If they'd lost that game, it would have been really disappointing given the start that they had. A lot of major improvements from Tonga and hopefully they can build on this for next year and possibly, possibly win the Pacific Championships next year. We will see, but that's Tonga in third. Moving on to second place, I have England. There wasn't a point in the series where I thought we have lost control over this game. Even though, of course, there were some great moments from Samoa, there wasn't a single moment where I thought we kind of lost it now. We're sort of all out of shape. We're all over the place. I always felt that we were in firm control. The carries through the middle were excellent. Defensively, the work through the middle was excellent. Spreading the ball to the left and the right, we weren't kind of pinned into one side of the field. I think that's hugely down to Harry Smith. Over on the left, Williams down on the right, and then Wellsby popping up on either side as well. Obviously, they did kind of shift across, like Harry Smith, you'd see him on the right sometimes. You saw that with his his beautiful pass across to Matty Ashton in the second game, I believe it was. But Williams over on the left as well. So they commanded both sides of the field really, really nicely. And I think shifting the ball structurally looked very, very sound. And just complete control over both games. Obviously, a little bit out of shape defensively when Samoa would spread the ball and, and chuck it around. That's understandable. That happens to everybody. But it just felt like an overwhelming sense of control. I never felt like we were going to be on the back foot at any point. I think that's mostly testament to, obviously, work rate through the middle. But Harry Smith, I think a lot of people are still a little bit too focused on trying to get Mikey Lewis in as soon as possible. When Harry Smith, who's just won four trophies and then commanded both games in the way that he did, has just shown that 
I think it's about time to just accept Mikey Lewis is fine coming off the bench as the hooker. Harry Smith is more than fine as the number seven. I think we've just got to accept that that's fine, okay? But England did a pretty good job in all departments. I think discipline at times still needs improving slightly and just overall execution. If we can do it a little bit faster, we could start to compete with the likes of Australia next year, but I'm really looking forward to that, um, that three-match test series against the Aussies next season. But that's England in second. Finally, in first place, and no surprise to anybody, it's going to be Australia. I think the way that they executed at least the basics were just better than everybody else. The kicking game, the kick chase, defensive pressure on the back of it. I think the work rate from the middles was excellent, especially from the edges as well. They did a lot of work. Cameron Murray got through a lot of tackles. Uh, Angus Crichton was exceptional this campaign as well. But yeah, just everybody in each position did the basics extremely well. But it didn't look like basic performances because... With the ball, they were spreading it extremely nicely. The pace and accuracy and efficiency that they were playing with was excellent. They had a clue with what they wanted to do from the start. To me, I don't think I ever really saw them on the back foot. I think there was a couple times they were beaten through the middle by Tonga and New Zealand at times, but they dealt with it very well. They were losing against Tonga at the start of the game in the final, but after that, they just came out swinging and I never looked like losing, to be honest. But yeah, just in all departments... The speed, efficiency, accuracy, discipline that they play at is just at the highest level compared to everybody else. And that's that's what you'd expect with the Aussies. And as an Englishman who's looking uh, looking forward to you know taking on the best best in the world, bring your best. Bring everybody. Bring Ponga, Walsh and Edwards at fullback. Go for it. And drink water. Bring your five best in every position. Bring Papenhausen as well. Why not? Put them all on. I want Australia's best because they can help us elevate to the, to the next level. But yeah, in all... All departments, Australia just were the best team. And yeah, they take my number one spot in the power rankings. Moving on to the team of the season. I'm going to go through honourable mentions first for each nation in alphabetical order. If I mention somebody here in the honourable mentions, it means that they have not made the team of the season. Australia, it's going to be Hamaso Tabai Fidel. Cook Islands, Brad Takirangi. England, Luke Thompson. Fiji, Semi Valame. New Zealand, Griffin Neem. Griffin Neem was fantastic, by the way. PNG, Sylvester Narmo, a try in each game. Fair play to him. Samoa, for me, was Jerome Luai. They really lacked quality in a lot of areas, Samoa, but Jerome Luai got them ticking on plenty of occasions, throwing the ball around. He helped to change the game in moments for Samoa. And for Tonga, Eliasa Katoa gets the honourable mention for me. So, those guys, they haven't made the team of the season. Or they haven't even made the top three in each position. But major props to Griffin Neem. He was very, very close to making the team of the season for me. But there's just a few others statistically or based on other reasons I have to give credit to. So they are my honourable mentions. So now for the actual team of the season. So going through my team of the season, I'm going to give you my top three in each position. The way this will work for the team of the season is if it's a position with only one player, such as fullback, 5'8", halfback, hooker or lock, first place will take the spot in my team of the season. If it's a position with two players, such as winger, centre, prop or second row, first and second place will both make the team of the season. The final thing to know is that for a player to be selected for this team of the season, they must have played in at least two fixtures. This means players such as Casey McLean for New Zealand or Luke Thompson, Liam Marshall and Dominic Young for England can't be selected for a team of the season because they've only played one fixture. So everyone on this list has at least played two fixtures between the Pacific Championships and the England v Samoa Test Series. Starting with fullback, in third place, Roger Tuivasa-Shek. In second place, Nenny McDonald. And in first place, making the team of the season, Keanu Kinney. Moving on to wingers, in third place is Robert Darby. Second place, Zach Lomax. But in first place for wingers for me is Sione Katoa. Moving on to centre, in third place and just missing out, is Petr Hiku. In second place is Tom Trebojevic. And in first place is Herbie Farmworth. Moving on to 5 8 In third place is Tui Lolahea. Second place, George Williams. And in first is Tom Dean. Moving on to the halfback position. In third place, it's going to go to Sean Johnson. In second place and just missing out is Isaiah Katoa. But in first place, it's going to be Harry Smith. Moving on to the props in the front row. In third place and just missing out is Patrick Carrigan. In second place is Joseph Tarpany. And in first place, it's going to be Adin Fanua Blake. Next up, we have the hooker position to round out the front row. In third place is Judah Rimbu. 
in second place is Sonny Luke. And finishing off the front row in first place is Harry Grant. Now we move on to the second row position. In third place, and just missing out, is Isaiah Papali'i. Second place, Tane Milne. And first place in the second row position is Angus Crichton. Finally, in the lock position, third place, Caleb Navale. Second place, Isaiah Yo. And in first place, to finish off my international team of the season, Jason Tamalolo. So to round out my team of the season, at fullback is Keanu Kinney. On the wings, we have Sione Katoa and Zach Lomax. At centre, we have Herbie Farmworth and Tom Travojevic. 5 8 is Tom Dearden. Halfback is Harry Smith. In the front row at prop, we have Adam Fanua Blake and Joseph Tarpany. Hooker is Harry Grant. Second row is Angus Crichton and Tarnia Milne. And at lock, we have Jason Tambalolo. Finally, we come to the top five tries of the international season. I understand there was a lot of great tries. There was a lot of great tries. I know because this is my short list. There's 20 tries on here and there's five on the other side. So I wrote down 25 tries at least that could conceivably be in the conversation for top five tries. And I then had to make another short list from those on which ones compared to the rest would not make a top five. So I eventually came to a top five list. And this is what I came up with. That is going to be it for this video. Let me know your thoughts on my power rankings, team of the season, and top five tries. Let me know your thoughts, who makes a team of the season, who's an honourable mention, who gets your best tries, what are the power rankings like for you, what would you have, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. But I just want to say massive thank you for the support over the last couple of weeks, especially with all the international stuff. It has been greatly, greatly appreciated. Plenty of new subscribers, we've hit a massive target that... I didn't think it was possible at this point. I like, crushed four and a half thousand. So it is truly appreciated. But if you'd like to become a member, just click the join button below this video. Subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with more rugby league content. Like the video if you enjoyed. It really helps to get out there to more people. But that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.